Great. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to present at B-Sides. I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, my name is Emma Wilson, and I'm a security uh, consultant at Accenture. I've had many very exciting projects over the last few years of my career, from being a security analyst, implementing antivirus and firewalls, um, to being a systems auditor. And most recently, I've had the privilege of being a cybersecurity project manager for one of the largest health authorities in BC. So it's been a really fun time so far. Um, last summer, I had a really exciting engagement with a client based in Geneva, uh, where our team looked at different applications of artificial intelligence in healthcare um, in many different countries in the Pacific. I'll just minimize my screen for a second. Um, so what I really wanted to do with all that really great information was share some of the findings on AI and healthcare um, with a broader audience. So really that's what this presentation is about is to share with you some of the findings. Um, again, this is more my own personal research and interest on AI and healthcare. I think it's really where things are going. Um, certainly there's a lot of hiccups and roadblocks with adopting healthcare AI. Um, as you can imagine, funding, um, resourcing, um, personnel, there's just so much happening that um, is creating some barriers and challenges to adoption of machine learning and AI in health. But I also think there's a lot of opportunity here. And I think, I think based on my research in uh, Asia, so countries like China, Taiwan, Japan, um, those kind of countries are adopting a lot of different healthcare applications, um, things like robotics, um, clinical decision support. I think that because they have been adopting that, it's really showing that this is possible. It's proven in some jurisdictions. Um, and therefore, you know, it's something that can certainly make its way over to Canada in the future. So just to clarify, this is based on my own personal interest. I hope you're interested as well. And it's really a high level presentation looking at some of the applications, um, some of the issues and concerns, and some of the security risks. So next slide here, does anybody recognize who this is? Kind of a trick question for you all. Okay, can anyone tell me what this slide is about? Okay, I only have one monitor today, so forgive me. So this is Lee Sedol, who is participating in a AlphaGo tournament. Um, for those of you who follow AI and what's happening, um, AlphaGo is an ancient Chinese game. And in 2016, there was a tournament where this um, Go champion um, basically competed against AlphaGo and AlphaGo won. And it was a hugely impactful event. It really shook the, um, the technology and just the, you know, the world, especially in Asia. And really, for the first time, we realized that this game, which is considered to be very complex, very challenging for a machine to learn, lots of nuances that were considered to be something only humans could understand, um, was something that could be achieved and understood and um, competed in by an AI. So that's something that was really impactful, and it, and it really uh, created shockwaves throughout um, much of Asia. Now, this was 2016. I have some suspicion that we've forgotten a little bit of this event and just how impactful it was. Um, but in many industries, this, this was seen as the event that um, proved what AI can do. Um, if machine learning and AI have been you know, used in retail, in finance, in insurance um, for many, many years before this. But this event, because it was so public and it was sort of fun, it was a game, really showed folks that AI can do um, some incredible tasks and, and learn. There are moments in the game, if you watch the YouTube, if you're a huge nerd like I am, where um, this poor fellow, Lee Siddle, would just be shocked. His jaw would drop and he was just completely perplexed by some of the moves the AI was making. Um, so really this showed the world that AI um, can learn complex tasks and can do things that uh, people can do. So you might be wondering, okay, Emma, get to the healthcare. So <laughs> AI has applications in many, many industries, um, as I'm sure you're aware, finance, um, you know, insurance, 
mining. There's many, many applications of AI. Um, I will be honest with you that my research has indicated to me that um, a lot of AI applications are not healthcare focused right now. And this is an, an, a sector that's been underserved by this new technology um, in general. However, there is also a lot of excitement in healthcare. Um, I think because we see healthcare as um, this area of work that can be really impactful to society as a whole and can really improve the lives of many people. Um, many other countries, not just Canada, have physicians uh, shortages and are really struggling with serving large aging populations, for instance, China and Japan. I interviewed many doctors there in this engagement last summer who note that if you could have, just like in IT and, com and computer science, IT service management, tier one, tier two, tier three, um, healthcare service where tier one, perhaps an AI or a chat bot talks to you and says, you know, hey, how are you feeling? What are your symptoms? Send me some pictures and you send that in and then they determine whether to, you know, send you off to a, to a doctor. Um, so that's one application. Um, and as well, there's there's so many applications. I think the, the one that I think is most palatable, if I was going to leave you with one um, application that I think is palatable now, um, it would be radiology. Um, the reason why is there's been a history of standardized quality data sets for decades in radiology, and there's a lot of training data out there in the format of images. Um, now, images, as you might know, you know, they, they can contain personal information, PHI. Um, however, there, there are standardized approaches to cataloging them and to um, basically linking what the image is of with a, a label or a title. Um, so really, if you go into a radiologist, there's this all this data is already available. It's relatively easy to train AIs to use that data to make um, recommendations and predictions. Um, and again, like I said, with the privacy aspect, there are ways of anonymizing or de-identifying images, um, but it's less, I'm going to say it's less of a, of a risk in the sense that the data is not as um, uh, obviously a, you know, a person if you're putting tons and tons of data into a training data model. Um, it's just images and therefore it's uh, a little bit less, I suppose, uh, controversial when you start to build algorithms that are using those images to uh, make diagnoses. Um, patient monitoring, robot assisted surgery, uh, cybersecurity, just administration, booking appointments, um, AIs that can crawl through EMR, electronic medical record systems to find patients that haven't been in in a while who have high risk factors and who can send alerts or text messages to those patients to say, hey, you haven't been in in a while. Um, and the last one there is clinical decision support or CDS. Um, so that again is kind of what I mentioned with that tier one, tier two is you could have um, really AIs that look at data on a patient and help to determine the decision of whether they should actually go into an office to see a person. Um, that's one you know, aspect of this. And other aspect of this with CDS is a doctor is seeing a patient and based on the records of that patient in their EMR file, electronic medical record system file, the doctor is suggested that this patient might have high blood pressure. Um, the doctor might still be then validating that, but um, you can kind of see how this could save time, right? And save re um, energy and resources for resource strapped physicians and doctors and, and other nurses and healthcare practitioners. So many, many, many applications of AI in healthcare. Um, what is happening in Canada? I really wanna focus on that. I think that's what we're interested in today. Um, so there's been a history of digitization and digital health in Canada. And the last 30 years have seen you know, incredible growth. We all know that we're all here. Um, but really based on my research, what I'd like to offer is that Canada has been a little bit risk averse and a little slower in approaching AI in healthcare. And there's many reasons for that we could go into, um, but what I really kind of want to offer is that really the last three or four years, five, six years, as you can see on this little timeline, and I've just, I've just selected a few events that I thought were interesting to you. Um, there has been really an explosion of investment from mostly public sector sources into healthcare AI. Now, why is this? Clearly, there's there's a seen value or perceived value 
of AI in, in benefiting Canadians and benefiting our healthcare institutions and systems. Um, so we've had really just incredible investments in the last few years. And recently as well, um, there's been more money in the in the most recent budget. So um, really looking at supporting a pan-Canadian AI strategy. So what else is happening in Canada? <clears throat> there's a lot of research happening in Canada. So we've had a lot of organizations, for instance, in Alberta, in Toronto, in Montreal, um, looking at AI applications, not just in healthcare, but in many sectors. Um, so I have one example on this slide, which is in 1993, Mila was founded at the University of Montreal. Um, that is a research institute that looks at AI in many different applications. Healthcare is one of them. So for instance, Mila helped to develop a medical um, chatbot as one example. Um, so it's happening. It is happening. And it's something that's been really, in my, in my view, happening more in the last five or six years. Um, but there is a but to this. And I think the, 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 the thing that is in my mind that you can probably understand, if I'll go to the next slide, is we are, in my, in my view, based on my research, lacking some, some key enablers in Canada in bringing um, AI into the healthcare space. So you might be wondering, you know, where is the money for this coming from? You know, healthcare and healthcare institutions already struggle in some respects um, in bringing innovative technology in. Um, so really, I've sort of answered that question, which is government is really, really pushing for this. Um, we're really investing in it from a Canadian government perspective and certainly many universities, um, local colleges and, um, you know, provincial governments are also investing in it. Um, so really, we should be seeing I'm hoping with all this investment, some really healthy new pilots, um, because what's happening in Canada in the last you know few few years of trying to explore AI and healthcare is a lot of research has died in this um, <laughs> pilot phase. So you get a lot of institutions, organizations, um, universities who have great idea ideas, and they pilot them and they explore some test data, and then there's just a huge barrier to getting this um, technology to clinical applications. Um, so why is that? There's, there's many reasons. I think a really good reason is simply that um, healthcare organizations are already resource stressed and it's really challenging to take the time and, and energy necessary to work with a university to bring in new technologies. Um, the second um, line of, of information here on data is also really key. So in Canada, we do have a lot of great big quality data sets. Certainly in Ontario, for example, you can get health data there from decades and decades past. Um, so we have lots of data. However, is it high quality data? So in some of my research from uh, last summer, when I was talking to many experts in AI, many startup founders in Asia, um, one of the things they mentioned was that a lot of times data exists in very separated systems and databases and it's not being connected. Um, there might be a lack of standardization. There may be fears over privacy and um, you know, the regulatory uh, parameters around how that data can be used. Um, the other thing is the data is just really messy quite often. I know I'm talking to the audience who will understand um, when you're dealing with large data sets uh, sometimes the data is not high quality data in a format that will be usable, um, whether it's, um, you know, an AI solution or any other kind of solution trying to use that data. Um, there's some huge challenges there. So there's actually been some startups, for instance, I talked to one fellow in Taiwan whose whole company, it's, it's a healthcare AI company, and they're just looking at uh, normalizing and making the data out of EMRs better quality. Um, before it'll be fed into another another AI algorithm that will look for um, some more um, useful healthcare applications. So to clarify, there's an AI just trying to make the data better quality before it can be fed into different applications. So I think that's something we can be wary of also happening in Canada. Um, and I think in Canada as well, there's concerns around privacy. So there's a need when looking at AI for um, understanding how to treat the data. Can we de-identify the data? Um, but I say not anonymization. Why is that? In healthcare, we need to use that data and it needs to be linked to a person in some way. So for instance, you might have large data sets from an EMR and an electronic medical record system. 
And you have an AI that can just, just crawl that and look for high risk patterns or issues um, that need to be alerted. So you might wanna bring in that patient who has a high risk of blood pressure. Um, so the issue is you might wanna de-identify the data when the AI is crawling it, but there has to be some way to re-identify patients once an issue is noted. Um, so you need to call the, the patient or send them an email or you know, otherwise contact them to come in. You have to identify them to let them know they need a specialist to look at their, at their health concern. Um, the last kind of key enabler I wanna talk about just briefly here, I see I'm running out of time, is culture, people, and skills. Um, so key enablers of AI in healthcare. Um, really in many sectors in, in healthcare, you have whether nurses and doctors, whether they're administrative professionals, whether they're, you know, IT professionals, they go to school for, you know, five, six to 10 years. Um, and then you also have these uh, folks working in AI research and AI, you know, piloting and, and test labs who are also extremely qualified, skilled people who go to school for a long time. So what I'm trying to say is there's these two groups that are highly skilled and bringing them together is the challenge. And the reason for that is they're very you know, busy in their own domains. Um, really, you need to find people, whether they're IT leads, CIOs, uh, even doctors. In, in many of the interviews I conducted in Asia last year, um, there's doctors who have their own AI startups. I think they just don't sleep those people. Um, and that's a cultural thing, right? That, you know, working, you know, and having those two or three different streams of activity and really working to not just provide medical services, but also looking at IT. Um, the other thing I'll add is in some of those countries that I was working in last year, um, you'll have folks who went to school for medicine, but were also doing a computer science degree at the same time, or they did some coding in their spare time while becoming a surgeon. And that's very common in some countries and perhaps less common in Canada. I don't have the data on that, but that's just the point I'd like to make is that translational champions are something we really need here um, in Canada if we want to bring more AI into healthcare. So I think just to summarize what I just said um, regarding funding data and sort of people, is we really do need to kind of understand that a bit better in Canada, in the healthcare space. So I think we need some trusted champions. It could be you listening in on this call. You don't have to be an expert in you know, machine language to you know, advocate for it and learn more about it. Awareness is the first step. Um, gaining the trust of those who are responsible for the data, getting creative, thinking about what else can be done with data. Um, and an already resource stressed system, we need to find a way to pilot new technologies that is re really cognizant and respectful of that. Um, in my view, that really requires strong partnerships between government, private sector, and educational institutions. So what we really need, um, in my view, is um, companies, private sector companies that are already playing in the AI space um, to really, whether you wanna call it pro bono or otherwise, to really look at some, um, applications of their technology that can benefit society. So whether that's partnering with a research um, hospital or partnering with a university or a small startup, we really need those, those partnerships to happen to move this forward. Um, data standards and interoperability, I think I already discussed that, but really that's something we need to think about a lot in Canada. And then lastly is guardrails and guidance. So evolving our regulations and standards in step with technology is necessary. Um, and we can't just keep saying, no, 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 patient data, client data can't be used for that. We really need to find a way to responsibly and respect, respectfully collect and share data in a way that provides value and can potentially even save people's lives, right? Some of these applications of AI um, can provide services and connections that um, not every doctor has time for. It, there's a strong possibility that you know, this technology can improve the healthcare that's delivered to, to Canadians. So we're really here to talk about security. I only have a few minutes left, so I'll just chat for a minute or so on this. People are adopting new technologies all the time. We all know this um, without considering um, security and other issues. So certainly senior leaders know that. Um, as regards AI generally, um, there's a lot of new ways to attack um, AI solutions. Um, so model manipulation, um, data poisoning, there's been a lot of recent hacks that are really exciting and interesting if you're into that. 
on, um, you know, like feeding feeding information into AI into Alexa. So Alexa is listening; she's always on, and I'm telling her, you know, uh, I need I need more grocery bags. You know, order some grocery bags. Um, there's there's ways that you can play a noise in the background that will give Alexa other orders or other um, commands. So um, data poisoning is basically injecting data into algorithms that, um, or into training models that can bias, that can bias um, and misclassify um, what something thinks something is. Um, so model compromise backdoors, really um, there's many different ways we can um, compromise AI, but I also would like to add, and I know this is a very high level brief overview, that there's ways I, AI can also be used for attacks. Um, and so um, I'll just go into that a bit more. So for instance, um, you obviously know that, you know, there's lots of bots on the internet. You can write AI programs that will look for um, the best way to hack a certain target based on, um, based on a whole library of different types of malware. There's, there's just so many different ways that um, AI can be used in, in, in cybercrime. Um, mimicking a real person, for instance, very simple example, when you're logging into a website and you're trying to, you know, I would never do this, but when you're trying to crack a password, right? If there's someone trying to log in, they can mimic more realistic human interactions with that login page rather than just, you know, um, just, you know, throwing a ton of different password ideas at it every couple seconds. They can wait a few hours, you know, try different things and learn from past passwords that didn't work. So there's just so, so many applications of AI in cybercrime. So then we really need to think about how to secure AI. And I know this is a really big topic and it's hard to overview in such a short time. So I hope we can discuss a little farther. And really my objective is to plant some seeds of ideas in your mind. Um, so to secure AI, really having some test labs where we can test different types of attacks and different types of compromise on AIs. Um, standardization is key. So really standardization is having, you know, data standards, quality standards, not buying products until they've been tested and vetted. Um, so that's also feeding into that next point, which is attestation. So really maturing Canada's approach to checking to make sure that technology is um, enterprise class or just appropriate for the task at hand. Um, transparency, a big issue um, that I've learned about is, um, do you trust an algorithm if you don't know how the algorithm works? So for instance, um, in implementing some, some AIs in hospitals and healthcare institutions, some medical professionals and doctors really don't like that they don't know how the algorithms work. Um, even if we're doing that kind of tier one, tier two support model I mentioned, um, if they don't know that if I submit a, a photo of my mole, if, if a doctor doesn't know how that algorithm works or if a pro professional doesn't know, um, they might just say, no, I don't want that technology. It has to, you know, they have to come in and see me in person anyways. Um, so understanding transparency of algorithms is key. Um, and then lastly, auditability is really having a way to figure out how things are actually making decisions, what data it's inputting. Um, so those are just some very high level concepts. And I wish I could talk about this to you for hours. Um, but the last point I think in purple there relates back to our point that we discussed about cybercrime. So using AI to address AI risks is a really exciting burgeoning area. Um, and I'll leave it there because we don't have too much time um, but really, I'd like to turn it back to you guys and hear some questions or ideas on, on this topic. I know it's hot. I know it's a hype topic, um, but cutting through the hype, there is some value here. What do you think is, you know, a valid way to use AI in healthcare? What do you think are some, some risks that are coming on the horizon? Um, what are your thoughts? I'm very excited to have a discussion with you. Okay, let's just back here. Awesome. So it seems like there aren't too many questions. I know that was very high level, but thank you so much for your time. It was great to talk to you and 
I'm certainly, you know, happy to share more. I have lots of information. Um, that was a very high level summary. And if you're if you're excited about this, I'd love to connect. So please reach out. Okay, we have one great question. Thanks, Ashley. So it's only been recently pharmacies have began to communicate with one another and still it's not all of them. It seems dangerous that they would not have a centralized database for each patient. What would you say is the primary factor blocking the sharing of information between these types of bodies for a patient? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it varies by jurisdiction. Um, in Canada, we do have a huge precedence for not sharing health data between provinces, territories, um, between pharmacies. And it's something that as a consumer of health services, I think we all find quite frustrating. Um, so what I will say is there's some good progress in this area. Um, for instance, in uh, I believe it was 2019, Canada, like the, the government of Canada, um, announced a grant of $49 million to support something called the Digital Health and Discovery Platform, or DHDP, um, which is looking to establish a Canada-wide data platform. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like, but the idea is to have really safe, secure, privacy-conscious, security-conscious um, linking of health data across Canadian jurisdictions, regardless of institution. So um, if you're curious about that, look it up. It's called um, DHDP, Digital Health and Discovery Platform. So it's something that the government in Canada is, is working on. Um, but I, I hear you, it's very frustrating. Any AI examples relating to COVID? Luke, I don't know if I have time to answer your question, um, but yes, a Google search will find many, many, many examples. Um, China is where you'll find lots of exciting and sometimes scary things happening. Yeah, actually, one other thing regarding AI and COVID is the tier one, tier two approach I met, I, method I discussed um, was used in China during COVID. And that was some, so COVID has been in, in some ways a, gr a good thing. Can I say that for really catalyzing uh, innovation in AI and digital health? So um, in China, the, you know, a lot of the um, state um, healthcare organizations did begin using an approach to having people answer online forms and surveys regarding their health, um, their, their COVID symptoms, and then um, diagnosing or, you know, evaluating them based on that. So whether that was done in a way that is um, the way we would do it in Canada, I can't speak to, but very interesting. I should also mention, I didn't go into detail on um, how can AI be used in discovering different diseases? This is really fascinating. So human minds can't go through genetics and like genetic data and find indicators of diseases, but AI can. Um, so you can take a huge data set of genomic data and run a, a certain kind of AI through it and find um, basically indicators of certain genetic diseases, which is fascinating and new. And this is something that people couldn't really do before AI. Um, so that's a really exciting um, application. So identifying um, genetic indicators of disease. And the other thing I'll mention regarding COVID and that question about disease is Google DeepMind did actually help with um, genetic sequence, genetic sequencing of um, the COVID um, virus using AI. I don't know the exact details of that, but check it out online if you're interested in, in um, DeepMind's. Um, I think what they did is they looked at the protein structure or did some research into the um, 
the structure of the virus using AI. Is there a reason we cannot hold our own records? Good question, Ashley, and I do not know the answer to that. I think you're always, you always have the right to your own data under almost every piece of Canadian um, health care, health privacy legislation. So you can at any time call up a clinic and get your records always, no matter what clinic it is. Um, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm quite certain that is the case. Um, but they're not in a unified um, database. And actually, I want to talk about radiology again, because I'm excited about radiology. So in, in China, during COVID, um, AIs were used to dis distinguish between regular um, chest radiology scans, images of um, pneumonia or common cold, and ones that were indicative of COVID. So there was a notable difference between the, the chest scans of someone who just had a cold and someone who had COVID-19. So um, that's another example of just how detailed and nuanced some of these AIs can be. Um, now, I'm not, I'm not saying I fully understand that algorithm or how um, you know, legitimate it was, but that was something that was used in, in, in China, which is really fascinating if it, if it worked out. All right, any other questions or comments? I know this was a bit less on security as, as than it was on more the kind of exciting, more new things happening in this area of work. So please let me know if you have any security ideas or questions and I'm really excited to discuss. <laughs>